The Man Who Saw the Light Over Winter Hill by Ian Gordon Twelve, January 6th, 1998 So now you know what I am, what I've become. I'm the thing that stalked myself. Ridiculous, unbelievable. I'd been too close to the fiery heart of the light, my frail body torched by it, but entangled, as they put it, with my doppelganger, who had been transferred to that other place, it seems my consciousness went with it at the moment of my passing. What am I made up of? Uh, I haven't a clue. But I can't stop myself from thinking about that vat in the empty facility, that colourless mass of flesh that reeked of raw meat, and the notes of that unnamed scientist who quite clearly was involved in the creation of whatever it was that grew inside that canister. He knew his work was terrible, knew that his actions were unethical, but it was out of his hands, he said, his every move directed by powerful and malignant forces. Those forces demanded malleable monsters, creatures capable of mimicking human beings, and it would seem that's exactly what the scientist and his team delivered. There was some sort of fusion involving human genetic material and something else. My money's on extraterrestrial DNA, <laughs> as crazy as that sounds. I doubt I'm far off the mark. <laughs> I said I'd fill in the blanks, didn't I? Well, there you have it. If I'm wrong, well, time will tell, won't it? I'm weak, fading fast. The worst of it is the condition of my skin. It's oozing now. Every hour or so I'm forced to visit the bathroom. Were in front of the mirror. I apply bandages to my weeping flesh. Like old Nash in the grey world, I look like a mummy, both in the skeletal limbs, torso and face I'm sporting, and the gunk-soaked dressings covering 75% of my body. It's a dreadful thing, I know, but this vessel isn't mine. Never was. The persistent pain is but a temporary indisposition. And as I stand there, struggling to keep my balance on stick-like legs, my recollections haunt me. Fleeting visions of scuttling through the undergrowth, creeping at curb height from street to street, crawling on all fours through empty yards. Memories of encounters with my old self, face to face in the bedroom upstairs. Images of the human face that I was once able to call mine. I remember the arrest and my subsequent incarceration, of the ghastly manner by which I was able to escape from that holding cell. Jesus! But I won't describe that. Not here, anyway. Let's just say that this body is far more flexible than I'd like to believe. No wonder it's coming apart. I only hope that these words are still legible. My hands are shaking terribly now. My feeble, wasted hands. My old self is disappearing. It's only by referring to the beginning of this script that I'm able to remind myself of the facts, the unbelievable realities that even now I'm having a tough time swallowing. The original me is up there on the moor, as cold as the ground on which it lies, undiscovered for now. Will they be looking for it? Will they retrieve it? Or will they leave it to rot? <laughs> But I spoke of a job, didn't I? Something I need to do to put an end to all this. An end to the threat we're all faced with. There's something up there on Winter Hill. It's always been there, folk like my dad say. A mysterious force of nature, the intermittent presence of which causes the occurrence of strange and inexplicable things. I think it's the element, as briefly discussed by those strange voices I heard. Something that at least to my mind, is enhanced by the transmitter up there. The malignant forces responsible for my transformation know this. The TV mast may as well be broadcasting an invitation to those foul things, an invitation to step into our reality and take over from within, 
to strip us of our humanity and replace us, one by one. Who they are and where they come from, I don't know. Why they're doing what they're doing is another question I can't answer. They're not like us, they don't look like us, and they certainly don't behave like us. I only know that I'm a consequence of their horrifying experiments, and I, like them, must be eradicated. I don't even want to think about what 5% could be referring to. I mean, the cloning and subsequent replacement of 5% of Narrow Valley's small population is terrifying enough, but what if 5% is applied to the entire county, or even the country? My efforts may be in vain, but I have to believe I can do something. That my awareness of what's happening puts me in a unique position. At the very least, I must try. The details of my plan will not be included here. I can't risk exposure prior to its execution. I don't know what else to say. It's getting late, and I need to get going. I'm not sure how far I'll get. It's a long walk, and it's all uphill. I'm weak, dreadfully weak. With that vento outside again, I'm going to have to sneak out the back way and hope to God I'm not spotted. And what about the police? What's their involvement now? Too many questions. Too little time. If I make it as far as the post box, you'll at least know that I reached the top of Chapel Lane. Wish me luck. I'm going to need it. Roman Hammond Smith. January 6th, 1998 Winter Hill TV Mast Targeted by Vandals By Barry Ellum From the Bolton Evening News, January 8th, 1998 A local landmark at Winter Hill has been targeted by vandals. Police were called to Rivington Moor on Tuesday, January 7th, following reports of significant damage to a support wire. These support wires, of which there are fifteen in total, hold the mast vertical. The loss of any one of them could result in the catastrophic collapse of the transmitter. The site remains temporarily closed to the public. Police believe this was an isolated incident, and is in no way connected to the discovery of the frozen remains of a local man, found later the same day on the slopes of Crooked Edge Hill. Enquiries remain ongoing, and no arrests have been made.